your name been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Let me see a show of hands that you know your name's been written down. How, let's do that one more time. How many know their names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Hallelujah. Who 
my goodness. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. But my goodness, our faces and our attitudes, hallelujah, we are so blessed. All that Jesus has gotten for us, all that he's obtained for us, hallelujah, and he's made a reservations for you, hallelujah, and for me in the kingdom. Living, reigning in this life now, and your name is written down to be with him. Hallelujah for eternity. Hallelujah. Eternal life is not a destination. Come on now. It's God. It's revealing the Father, Jesus said in John chapter 17. You have eternal life. That's the divine exchange. Your life. He took all of our lives and gave us his life. Without sin. Glory to God. Jesus. On the cross, on my pain, and the guilt and the shame, Jesus bore my suffering.
be ministering today from Jeremiah chapter 32 mainly. Of course, we'll go other places in the scriptures. Father, thank you for your presence in this house. We ask you to activate your word that would come alive in our hearts and we'd be receptive and responsive in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. For the king of Babylon's army had besieged Jerusalem. Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. It's a very unusual situation that Jeremiah finds himself in. Jeremiah had pretty much stood alone against the easy prophets of his day. He had warned Judah and Israel over and over, if you don't repent, if you don't change your ways, God will remove his restraining hand and give you over to Babylon that the king of Babylon will besiege your cities. But they thought, if you read Jeremiah chapter 7, because they had the temple and because they went and worshiped on the Sabbath, that that made whatever they did okay and that they were okay with God. Does that sound familiar? Matter of fact, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 7, you steal, lie, commit adultery, And do evil things. And then you come and stand before me in my house and say, we're delivered to do these things. In other words, it don't matter how we live. We're saved no matter what we do. So God, we're not legalists now. We don't have to really live right. And most of the prophets said, Babylon will not come. I'll defeat Nebuchadnezzar. It's not going to happen. Jeremiah said it will happen. They're coming. They'll besiege this city. They'll destroy it. They'll take us away captive. But that's not the end because God's merciful will return and rebuild. Now, it's interesting if you're watching the news. I'm certainly not putting an indictment against the people of Ukraine. I've never seen such bravery in this generation. And but I want you to realize that just as they are besieged now. It would be similar if Jeremiah was living in Kiev in the Ukraine. How many know the Russian army has besieged it? And while it's besieged, we say, why is he in prison in the king's house? Because when you're telling your nation that the enemy's going to win, the king's going to shut you up because that's discouraging, right? But there's an unusual thing that happens. He's in the court of the prison and he's warned they're coming. Now they are besieged. They're completely surrounded. The Babylonians are trying to starve them out. And they're about ready to take them captive. But yet there's a ray of hope. And if you go down to the sixth verse, Jeremiah said... While this is happening, while it's besieged and the enemies are closing in, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come to thee, saying, Buy thee my field, which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, According to the word of the Lord, and he said to me, buy my field, I pray thee, that's in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of the inheritance is thine, the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that it was from the word of the Lord, so I bought the field. Now keep in mind, this field is already, this property is already besieged and covered with Babylonian soldiers. So Hananiah, my uncle's son, came to me in the court. He said, buy it for thyself. I knew this was a word from the Lord. I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth. And I weighed him the money, 
17 shekels of silver. I subscribed the evidence and sealed it. I took witnesses. I weighed the money in the balances. I took evidence of the purchase, both that was sealed according to law and custom, and that which was open. I gave the evidence of the purchase to Barak, the son of Neriah, of Messiah, son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses, I subscribed the book of the purchase. Before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison, I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, the evidence of the purchase which is sealed, the evidence which is open, put them in an earthen vessel, that they may continue many days. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Houses, fields, and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. What a way to demonstrate hope. He makes a real estate transaction. He buys a piece of real estate that is, and, and I don't understand how this works. Here he is in prison and he's still got enough money to buy real estate. God has a way of making way for his people. He purchases it. He has a deal. The deed signed and sealed. He records it at the courthouse. He goes through all the procedures and he seals it and makes sure that everybody knows there's a deal because he says, I have a word from God and I want people to know that when God speaks to me, I'm going to live according to what he says. Yes. Amen. This is what I want you to see this morning. Our actions demonstrate whether or not we believe what we say we believe. It is so easy to say, I believe Jesus is coming again, but does your life signify that you believe that? It's easy for us to say, well, I believe the promises of God, but do you live like? Are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? Are you willing to say, look, I'm going to show by the decisions that I make, by the actions that I take, that I believe what God has promised? You say, but pastor, we're living in a day when everything imaginable is going against the church. Well, I've got news for you. The church will prevail. Amen. Do you believe the church will prevail? Yes. They've been trying to destroy the church for 2,000 years. Ever since Christ gave his life on the cross, emperors and kingdoms, communists, socialists, and Islamists have tried to wipe out the church of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Oh, pastor, I'm just going to hold up somewhere and see what happens. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to see the flourishing of the kingdom of God. I'm going to see the expansion of the body of Christ. He is not returning for a weak, helpless, anemic church. He's returning for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. So no matter what the devil does, when the dust settles, the church of Jesus Christ will be standing strong in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. Unto him who is able, Ephesians 3.20, to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory, say it with me, in the church by Christ Jesus, just for a short time, no, to all generations, forever and ever, amen. <laughs> the devil can't whip us. He can't defeat us. And even if those are martyred for the gospel of Christ, only thing he does is send them home early and they're getting ready to come back with Christ. Amen. Is that not exciting? Where did he place his ministry? Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teacher. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Church is not the pastor's idea. Amen. And church is not this building that we're sitting in. Right. You are the temple of the living God. Yeah. We are his church. I've seen them bomb and destroy buildings. And yet the church still meets. The church still worships. The church still prevails. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Don't buy into this defeatist religious 
attitude that the church is just going under and this is the great falling away and there's not going to be any of us left. And yeah, there's been a falling away. I've seen that. But there's also coming a resurrection power in the body of Christ. And he's not coming back for a defeated bride. Powerful. I believe we're going to walk in a stronger anointing than ever before. I don't care what the devil says. We are not going under. We're going over. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. We will not lay down and accept defeat. We're not going to hole up somewhere and say, oh, well, there's probably more variants of COVID coming. So we're just going to shut down. No, we're going to prevail. Do you believe it? Tell the person next to you, then act like it. You believe the church will prevail? Oh, I don't know. Well, I do. Amen. And if you don't want to be part of it, that'll be your problem. I want to ask you another thing. Do you believe we'll, you'll reap what you sow? Do, do you believe that? Then it ought to affect how we live. Listen to Galatians 6, 9, and 10. And he's writing to a persecuted church when he writes this. Let us not be weary in well-doing. How many sometimes just get tired of doing right? I have. Like, oh, man, I'm just wore out. And everything, it just seems like all hell has come against me. And everything I try to do, as soon as I, it's like, did anybody ever try to walk the wrinkles out of a rug? And when you step on one here, it pops up over here, another one, and you go walk on that one, and then it pops. That's how I feel life is sometimes. And I'm just tired, and I'm just weary, and I'm like, Lord, it just seems like the more I do right, the more wrong comes against me. I'm going to tell you something. The devil is a liar, and I'm not, I, I've been weary, but I'm not going to quit doing good. I'm not going to let it mess me up. I'm not going to stop sowing seed into the kingdom of God, into people's life, because there's a due season coming. There's a harvest coming, and I'm going to reap. You say, well, yeah, but when it gets really bad, it'll change. No, it won't. Are we still on the planet? Listen to what God told Noah about seed time and harvest. Genesis 8, 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. <laughs> Do we believe that today? <laughs> 75 degrees last week and 12 this morning? Huh? Global warming. Summer and winter. Day and night will not cease. You will still be able to sow and reap until the Lord returns and creates a new earth. So quit letting the devil tell you, oh, we're so close to the end now. We can't really do good because <clears throat> let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Therefore, as we have opportunity, tell the person next to you, look for opportunities to do good. Let us do good to all, especially to them who are of the household of faith. The devil will have you to quit being forgiving, to quit being generous, to quit being loving, to quit being kind. He'll tell you it's not profited you anything. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to continue to sow mercy. For blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want to continue to sow kindness forgiveness. I want to continue to do what I'm doing right now and sow the word of God into your life. I want to continue to sow financially. I want to continue to sow God's unmerited grace, his favor and his love. And I'm going to plant as much as I can because Paul said, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. I can't afford to become bitter and unforgiving. And neither can you. Man, I've known people to walk away because they got hurt and they're nursing. They say they're hurt, but the real thing is they're unforgiving. Don't look at me like that. Oh, they're just so hurt. They just don't want anything to do with God or church anymore. No, they're unforgiving because of their wounds. And as long as they're unforgiving, that'll fester and never heal. 
You know, there's a spiritual infection that'll set in if you're unforgiving and it's like gangrene. It'll eat away at you and destroy. I know people, you know, I've known people, they're mad over something that happened 30 years ago and some of the people they're mad at are dead and the others don't even remember the incident. Turn loose of it. So grace, so mercy. Be forgiving, be loving. Say, well, you don't know how wrong they did me. Do you know what that is? That's a real opportunity for you to sow into the kingdom of God. So mercy and grace and forgiveness. Amen. Look at David in the life of King Saul and look at the mercy he sowed. Boy, there came a day he needed mercy. Unless you think you can make it from here on out without ever making another mistake, you better be merciful to others. And if you think that, you really need to be merciful. Listen to me. Not only do we need to be careful to sow into the spirit and to sow good things, we need to be careful not to sow evil things. We need to be careful not to sow to the flesh. Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. In other words, you don't want to let that grace flow through your life. Lest a root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And it won't just trouble you because you'll gossip and thereby many will be defiled. Amen. We need to pull some weeds Amen. and sow some seeds. I'm going to say it again. We need to pull some weeds and sow some seeds. Jeremiah says, I know it don't make sense. I know it don't look right. But God told me we're coming home to this land. So I'm going to go ahead and invest in this land. I'm going to invest. I'm going to purchase. I'm going to seal the deed because I'm believing the word of God in spite of all the hell that rages around me. I'm believing this for the people of Ukraine, that God still has a plan and a purpose. Amen. Now I want to ask you, do you believe you're going to stand before the Lord and give an account? Do, do you believe it, huh? If you do, listen, if we really believe what I'm saying, that we're going to stand before God someday and give an account, we're going to reap what we sow, we'll never, ever be mean, stingy, unforgiving. Can you be if you believe this? Boy, it got quiet when I said that. I want to ask you this. Do you really believe that God will still strengthen the faithful? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Don't make sense sometimes, but I'm going to continue to wait. And to wait means to serve. And you serve God by serving his people. And even though it looks impossible, I want you to know the same storm and wind that brings destruction to others. If we're eagle saints, that wind will lift us up above the storm if we'll just spread our wings and wait on the Lord. <laughs> the Bible says about Abraham in Hebrews 6 15 so after he patiently endured everybody say patiently endured he obtained the promise. Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. God has a rescue. God has a plan. God has a purpose. Abraham, it looked impossible. Here he is over 100 years old and his wife's in her 90s. And God said, just keep believing. And he did. And he saw the promise. Do you really believe that he'll strengthen those who wait on him? How many has just felt like at times you couldn't make it any further and then you got in his presence and the power of God gave you supernatural strength to move on? Do you believe his promise to reward his own? Paul says in Romans 8, 18, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory 
Man, I don't know about you, but you need to read about the Shekinah, the glory, the power, the manifested presence of God. Let all hell raise, raise and rage against us. We are moving into the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty, and we're going to experience the very presence and glory of God in a way that will just be above and beyond anything we've experienced. I remember reading in Voice of the Martyrs how Mr. Wormbrand was imprisoned by the Soviets in the 80s. Made him stand for days with brilliant fluorescent lights against glossy walls. And went to change guards one day, and you can believe it if you want to. It doesn't matter. But in between the changing of the guards, Jesus himself walked into that cell wrapped his arms around that man and gave him supernatural strength. And he said, all that I went through to have that personal encounter with Jesus like that made it worth it all. They came back and said, how are you strong? How do you have strength? How are you making it through this? And he's still alive today because he had a real manifestation of the glory of God. Daniel, you're going in the lion's den. That's okay. I'm going to see the glory of God in there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're going into the furnace. You're going into flames. That's okay. The glory of the Son of God will be revealed in the flames. It's going to be worth it. <laughs> I wouldn't trade my relationship with Jesus for all that the world has to offer. I refuse to give up and lay down and be defeated and be depressed. I don't say that lightly because I battle depression sometimes. But you hear what I said? I battle it. I don't give in to it. Excuse me. Well, we know. Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. If you realize your calling, your purpose, that you're not just here on the planet by accident, it's amazing what God can do through and for and with you. Amen. Listen to this. He's got rewards for his own. Hebrews eleven six, and I read this in six translations today. Without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder <laughs> of them that diligently seek him. He doesn't just exist. It's not just faith to come and believe that He'll save you, but you need to understand that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. And the word reward is in almost every translation. I want you to hear this. I've been rewarded with His touch, rewarded with His Spirit, rewarded with His presence, rewarded with the very person of Christ Himself and the Holy Spirit living within me. What a reward. It's not over. I may know we're going to rule and reign as kings and priests in the new earth. And our reward is great. Can you hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. <laughs> Your reward is great. Every life you sowed into, every time you shared my name, Every time you shared a word, every time you supported some mission project and you couldn't get there, but you could help somebody else, you cannot sow into my kingdom. You can't be good to others without me watching and I will be rewarding you. The Bible said every man's work, 1 Corinthians 3, will be tried as by fire. If it's hay, wood, and stubble, if it's just selfishness, it'll be burned up. But if it's gold, silver, and precious stones, the Bible said you've got a reward coming. <laughs> Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's to try you. The only thing the fire does for the true believer is burn away the dross, the worthless, and the imperfections and reveal the gold, the value, the silver. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. 
God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He said, but pastor, I've known Christians to, to, to die in poverty. You don't know what their reward will be. I'll guarantee you they don't want to come back here. <laughs> Amen. Jesus says this. It, please hear this. If you don't hear anything else I'm saying, young people, please hear this. Life is shorter than you think. Here I am a grandpa, and it seemed like just the other day we were newlyweds. Like Josh and Shina, by the way. Give them a hand. <laughs> It's a vapor. Listen to what Jesus says. What is it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Listen. And he will reward each according to his works. You believe you're going to be rewarded for doing the right thing? Live like it then. Act like it. Do like Jeremiah and say, I'm going to show by what I'm doing that I believe in the promises of God. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to to his works. Listen, do you really believe you're going to stand before God and give an account? Do you? Well, you watch how you talk to people, how you treat people. If you realize you're going to stand before him, the Bible said we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You believe, do you really believe in his return? 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 6. I was talking to somebody close to me not long ago, and they said, I'm not looking for the coming of the Lord. I've been hearing that ever since I was a kid. I said, that's exactly what the Bible says the last generation will say. Yeah. Knowing this, there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts. That's why they don't want to believe they're going to stand before God saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This they're willingly ignorant. In other words, they don't want to know better. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, was perished, being overflowed with water. Watch this. He's saying back in Noah's day, Noah preached for over 100 years there's a flood coming. Over 100 years, right? And I probably the first 10 years, people are like, oh, well, maybe so. We're going. But after 20 years, they're like, oh, that crazy old guy. Still working on that boat. 30 years, 40, 50. He really believes there's a flood coming. And just about the time they gave up believing, the skies darkened. It began to thunder and they experienced something they'd never experienced before as rain came down in torrents and the fountains of the deep were broken up. And there's evidence even today of that great flood. There's fossils of fish and sea creatures on the highest mountains of the earth. How'd they get there? God said, I'll just shake this planet a little bit and let the ocean slosh over because I said it was going to happen. Peter says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as of a day. And the reason he hadn't come back sooner is because of his patience with the fruit of the earth and he wants as many to be saved as will. But if a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, we're just moving into the third day since he left. In his mind, standing in the heavenlies, it was just day before yesterday that his hands and feet were pierced and his back was ripped open for you. It's that fresh in his mind, his redemption price for you. Do you believe he's coming again? If you do, it'll affect how you live this week. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to us not willing that any should perish but 
that all should come to repentance. Well, what are people going to be like just before the Lord comes back? Well, let's see what Paul said about this in 2 Timothy 3. You should know this, Timothy. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. People will love only themselves, the selfie generation, and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents, and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving, unforgiving. They'll slander others, and they'll have no self-control. They'll be cruel. They'll hate what is good. They'll betray their friends. They'll be reckless and puffed up with pride. They'll love pleasure rather than God, and they'll act religious, but reject the power that make, would make them godly. Hang out with folks like this. Huh? Stay away. You know why you stay away? Because they'll influence you to think the same way. Are you hearing me? Stand with me. I'm glad you're all here this morning. You know what? I think your being here is a testimony that you have some faith in some of the things that I'm speaking to you today. All right? We're about ready for the Lord himself. <laughs> I love that. You know, he could have just sent an angel. He could have just zapped us. But instead, he's coming. He's coming in person to pick up his bride. Woo! The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Say, Pastor, does that mean I shouldn't plan for the future here? No, because we don't know when he's coming. Live like he's coming tomorrow and plan and invest as if you're going to live the rest of your life naturally here. But it will show by the way you treat people and the way you live and the way you act, whether or not you really believe in the promises of God. I know I'm going to reap what I sow. I know if I'm unmerciful, I'm going to reap that. I know if I'm hateful, I'm going to reap that. I know, I know if, I'm, uh, if I don't care to share God's grace with people that I, I'm going to reap that. And young people, listen, if the Lord tarries till your parents, you may reap some of what you sowed in your own kids and how they treat you. So honor your father and your mother. Amen. Do you hear me? How you live shows whether or not you really believe in the promises of God. Jeremiah said, I believe in what God promised so much that I'm going to invest what I have in the future that I have from God's Word. Father, help us to live out our faith in this crazy world we live in according to your promises and your Word. In Jesus' name. Altars open.
Oh, oh, oh. 